Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. So, how many have their Bibles or their Bible app? You got to ask these questions these days. I used to get angry when I saw people fooling around with their device while I'm preaching, but then I realized they might actually be listening and taking notes, so I can't really diss them without further information. So, whichever, whether you have your Bible or your Bible app, I want you to start with me today by turning to Acts chapter 10. I want to share a message with you called The Six Things That Prepare You for Your Purpose. Six Things That Prepare You for Your Purpose. And you do have a purpose in Christ. Everybody does. Every child of God has a purpose. God has a plan for your life. And the reason why so many Christians never find true fulfillment in their life is because they never find their purpose. So there's nothing for God to work with in their life. They don't know what they're doing. They're sort of like a ship without a compass. They're just kind of roaming around. They don't really know what they're doing and why they're doing it. So it's important to maximize our time and make the most of the life we have. How many of you know we only go around once? Okay, this is it. We can't come back and undo the mistakes the first time around. We're here, we're here once, and after this comes the judgment. So let's make the most of the life we have by finding out what our purpose is. Why are we here? And what are we supposed to do? Because it's in finding your purpose that you position yourself for God's blessings in your life the way he wants to bless you. Okay, he wants to bless you but you have to cooperate and get in the flow and get in the lane that he has designated for you to run your race within. So from Acts chapter 10, look with me at verse number 30. Acts chapter 10 and verse number 30. We're going to pick up reading in the middle of a chapter where the gospel is introduced to the Gentile church. Cornelius' house is where this takes place. And here in chapter 10 and verse 30, Cornelius talking to Peter he says, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And I said, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. 32, send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. Verse 33, so I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all things commanded you by God. And I have that highlighted in my Bible, or in my Bible app. The point is, we have a responsibility, and it's the greatest responsibility any human being could ever be given by God, and that is the responsibility to share the gospel with people who need to know what we know about salvation. And I can just picture in my mind at Cornelius' house, all of these people gathered together. They've been waiting for days for this man, Peter, to show up. They don't know him. They don't know where he comes from. And they don't know what kind of message he's going to give to them. But they're sitting there waiting. And uh, Cornelius says, you know, we're all excited about whatever it is you've got to tell us because we know you've been with God and you have a message from God that's going to change our lives. And we're just waiting to hear from you. And the message changed their life. They got saved and the gospel was introduced to the Gentile world through this encounter here at the house of Cornelius. And so that's what we're all here to do. In one way, shape, fashion, or form, we're all supposed to be doing what Peter was doing there at Cornelius' house, sharing things with people because of what we've learned and what we know from our presence with God and in his presence and with the Bible and our Bible study and all of the things that we do to uh, learn about the God in whom we love and in whom we serve. So when we talk about six things that plan or prepare us for our purpose, I want to take you to a verse in Acts where we're going to find these six things in one verse. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 22. And we're going to find these six things listed in verse number 10. So find Acts 22, just back up a few chapters from the 30th to the 22nd chapter and the 10th verse. Now, this is a passage that I'm going to read to you from the Worrell translation, A.S. Worrell translation. 
Uh, you may have a King James or a New King James, whatever. They're all pretty close, but I'm using this one, and, and, and the video folks are putting this up on the screen, um, because the world translation is a translation that's out of print. You can't get it anymore. You can't go find it online, can't go somewhere to you know, Amazon or whatever. It's out of print. It's been out of print for many, many years. Uh, Worrell was a man that lived at the turn of the 20th century, and he was considered to be, in his day, the leading scholar on Hebrew and Greek. And his translation of the New Testament is considered by uh, Bible scholars to be the most accurate translation of the English language from the Greek to the English that there is, the most accurate. So I have it in my library, and I use it to study from, and I read from it. So I'm going to read that verse to you from that translation. Here's what he said, Acts 22.10. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? This is Paul talking to Jesus. The Lord said to me, Arising, go into Damascus, and there it shall be told you concerning all things which have been arranged for you to do. All right, Paul asks the question, what shall I do, Lord? The Lord says in reply, Arising, go into Damascus, and there it shall be told you concerning all things which have been arranged for you to do. In that verse, there are six things that are going to help you define and find your purpose. And when you find that purpose, you're going to tap into a flow from God that you'll have to pinch yourself to see if it's really you. Because good things will be coming your way. All of the promises of God are connected to your purpose. And that's what we're going to find here in Acts 22.10, these six things. Starting with number one. And number one is the question that Paul will ask Jesus. What do you want me to do? Do is the word I want to emphasize to you from that question. Doing something. Okay, God has many, many promises in the Bible, but all of those promises are connected to things we do. God never promises to bless what you don't do, but he does promise to bless what you do. You have to want to do something. There are many Christians that think that Christianity is a spectator sport, meaning to say we just come to church, we just kind of read our Bible, we just kind of watch things unfold. We're not really in the mix. You got to want to get involved. You got to want to do something. When I got saved, I could no longer just sit along the sidelines and let people go to hell. I had to do something about it because I found out what eternal life meant and what it what it took to get there. And I just couldn't be I just could not sit along the sidelines any longer and let people die without at least trying my best to tell them something I know about where they're going to go if they don't know Jesus. I wanted to do some things. Paul said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's the first question we need to ask ourselves after we get saved. What is it you want me to do, Lord, with the knowledge I now have concerning eternal life? God promises to bless you when you get involved. Look at 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter number 7. And I want to read to you from the third verse, starting there. Okay, 2 Kings Chapter 7 and the third verse, okay? Now, in 2 Kings, chapter 7 and the third verse, there are four lepers here. It says, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we will die there. If we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall only die. If I may paraphrase, they say, look, if we sit here, we're dead meat anyway, so let's get up and surrender. Maybe they'll let us live, because if we just sit here and do nothing, we're dead anyway. So it says in verse 5, they, they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians, and when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. Verse 6. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. And so they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Verse 7, Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, tents, horses, and donkeys, and they fled for their lives. Now imagine this, an entire army of Syrians is running for their lives thinking a big army is coming over the hill against them when in fact it's four lepers. Four lepers are coming over the hill to surrender 
And they're running for their lives because God caused them to hear something. Listen, this is how it works. When you want to operate by faith, you do what you can do and God will do what you can't do. God did something they could never do. When they did something that they could do, they got up. They, they got into action. They did something. They said, why do we sit here until we die? Let's, let's do something about this situation. And they did, and God did. Okay? God caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise, and as a result of the noise they heard, they ran for their lives. Okay? And you, you and I need to understand and, and, and to remember that this is how God works. Okay? Uh, we do what we can do. God does what we can't do. But he's waiting for us. If you look, look with me at verse 5. It says, they arose at twilight to surrender. They arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. At twilight. Look at verse 7. The enemy arose at what time? To flee for their lives. Twilight. In other words, the moment these guys did something, God did something. Well, God, you know, we're all waiting for God to do things when in reality God's waiting for us to do something. God's waiting for us to get in the mix and commit to the fight. Then he's got something to work with, and he'll do what we can't do. He's in the business of doing what we can't do when we do what we can. So that's number one. What do you want me to do? Make sure you're in the mix. Make sure you want to get involved. Okay? That's where things start. Number two, from Acts 22.10, when Jesus answered that question, the first word he used was the word arising or arise, get up, okay? If I say to you, get up or arise from where you're seated or where you're sitting, I'm telling you to get up and move, all right? Movement is involved. You're going to transfer your position from one place to another. You're arising. This talks about preparation. You got, when you want to be involved, you got to spend some time preparing, for me in my life, I, went, I was sent to a Bible school for nine months. And I prepared there for what God wanted for me to do over on the other side of the world. Okay, But for you, it could be something different. It's different for every person, I suppose. But what we need to remember is that you have to plan ahead. You have to study. You have to save money. You have to mark your calendar, you know. Uh, as an example, there's missions trips, you know, for next year's schedule. Well, put something on a calendar a year in advance and put it on the calendar and mark it and say, that's my goal. I'm going to be ready to go on that trip or, you know, the church is in a, you know, debt reduction program here. I'm going to, I'm going to pay this much by this amount, by this date. That's my goal. And I plan for this and I start saving money for this and I start setting money aside for this and I alter my life style because of this. I'm, I'm preparing. I'm doing what I can do. I'm arising. I'm getting myself in position for God to bless me the way he says he wants to. Okay? I, go, I want to get involved. Um, Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17 is uh, using Paul as the example for this. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17, the Bible says that Paul, in fact, if you turn there with me, I'll read it with you. Uh, let's see, Galatians chapter 1 and the 15th verse. This is Paul. This is the beginning of his ministry. Okay? And it says, When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, verse 16, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Notice, he went into Arabia. Now, we don't know how long he was there. The Bible is silent on that topic. We don't know how long he spent in Arabia. But while he was there, he was being trained and prepared for his ministry, which started in Damascus. You know, if you read it from Acts, it looks like he got saved and just went right into Damascus and started preaching to everybody, but that's not how it worked out. He went to Arabia for an unspecified amount of time, and it was during that time in the desert that God prepared him for his ministry. He gave him the revelation of the gospel. He told him what happened when Jesus died on the cross. And Paul writes about it in Galatians and in other books. He talks about how this revelation did not come from flesh and blood, but God gave me revelation. Well, he got that revelation in Arabia and then came into Damascus and launched the ministry based upon all that he did to prepare himself for what was in store for him ahead. 
When God first told me to go to the Philippines, it was in October of 1979. I was a student at Rama, and uh, you know, I, I for the rest of that year, for that year, and for the spring and early summer parts of 1980, I was still a student. But during the six to seven months of time, I began to prepare for my trip to the Philippines. Uh, you know, saving money, doing what I could do. I sold all my possessions when I left the U.S. out of LAX. In, in September of 1980, I flew away with $20 in my pocket, 20 bucks. I had sold everything, given it away, you know, cleared my debts, paid my bank notes, everything. I, I owed nobody anything. I was a single man. I cleared the slate, put $20 in my pocket, that's all I had left, and with a one-way ticket, flew to the Philippines, not knowing if anybody would meet me on the other side. That was the loneliest flight of my life. I got to tell you, man, when we landed in Manila and I looked out the window and all the Filipinos are pulling their stuff off the overhead binge, you know, and jabbering in Tagalog and all these other languages, I don't know what they're saying. They're all getting ready to meet family and friends, and I'm sitting in this seat by myself, and I thought to myself, I realized where I was. <laughs> Dear Jesus, I'm on the other side of the world, and I mean, I got $20 in my pocket and no way back. I mean, if I have missed God, I'm screwed. I've got nowhere to go. I don't know anybody. No one's there to meet me. And down at the bottom of the stairs are two guards with Uzis, submachine guns, greeting the passengers and frisking them as they get off the jet. I'm thinking, man, this ain't Kansas no more, Toto. I mean, we're not, we're, we're somewhere in uncharted territory. But God, thank God for these rhema moments, spoke to me sitting in that seat. Man, I mean, my heart was in my throat. I'm thinking, what have I done? And God said, listen, you are doing what I told you to do. You're in the right place at the right time. I will take care of you. Yeah. <sighs> Thank God for that word from the Lord. Made my way south, you know, made my way down to Mindanao and got hooked up with the guy that I eventually worked with for a couple years there. And I went to one of his churches a few weeks later and there was Ethel. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And I thought to myself, no, that's what I'm talking about. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, we've been married for 30 years. Praise God. None of that would have happened if I had sat back and played it safe. You got to risk something, which brings us then to point number three from Acts 22.10, and that's the word go. Jesus told Paul, arising, go somewhere. Go. G-O. Exclamation point. You got to get in the game, you got to commit, and you've got to risk something. Convenient giving does not impress God. God is not interested in, in your convenient gifts. He's interested in sacrificial gifts, something that stretches you, impresses God. If it doesn't stretch you, it's not impressive to God. Look with me, if you would, at Psalms number 50. Let's go to Psalms 50. Okay, find Psalms. And find number 50, and when you do, go to verse 5 with me. One of my favorite passages from the Old Testament here, Psalms 50, verse 5. And this is what it says. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Notice, God specifically says, don't gather everybody, just the ones that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, okay? It's the sacrificial giving that prepares you and allows God to fulfill your purpose. It's, it's being willing to move beyond your comfort zone. It's being willing to move beyond what's convenient for you. It's stretching yourself. It's moving into uncharted territory. It's being willing to go places you've never gone, willing to do things you've never done, willing to meet people you thought you'd never meet. I, in a million years, would never have thought that God would send me halfway around the world and build a ministry from scratch, what you saw on that screen a few minutes ago is just a small portion of what God's used us to do for 33 years since September of 1980. We estimate conservatively that our ministry has been able to lead, and praise God for this, it's all because of him, three quarters of a million people to Jesus. Over 750,000 people. Not counting the churches, not counting the Bible school and all the lives that have been affected just because I was willing to suck it up and get on a plane with 20 bucks and take a risk. 
Praise God. You have no idea, friends, what waits for you on the other side of your commitment to risk something for Jesus. All kinds of blessings are waiting for you over there that many people in heaven will have never experienced because God's thankful that they're there, of course. He's happy they got saved, but Jesus is going to say, you know, there was so much more for you. There were so many more people I wanted you to meet, so many more things you could have done. Your life could have meant so much more. I'm glad you're here, but man, how much you missed because you were afraid to step out and commit, afraid to go anywhere, to do anything. Hallelujah. So let's go. Let's get involved. Amen. All right, back to Acts 22.10. Fourth thing out of that verse, when Jesus said go, he said to go into Damascus. He said go someplace specific, meaning to say, you know, God does not just shoot from the hip. He has a specific Thing he wants you to do in a specific place at a specific time. Paul was not told to go to Jerusalem. He was not told to go wherever he wants. He was not to go, told to go wherever the Spirit leads. He was not told to go to Antioch or to Rome or to any of these other places. He was told to go to Damascus. Go there, okay? When you commit, when you decide to get in the game, praise God, God is going to be specific with what he wants you to do. Now, if it's in business, then it will be, uh, you know, dealing with the business endeavors you're involved with. Whatever it takes, if it's ministry, then it will be ministry things. It could be whatever to whomever. But the point is that God wants to be specific with you. Look with me at Acts chapter 16. Uh, let's see this in action from Paul's ministry once again. Acts chapter number 16 and look with me at verse 6, okay? Find Acts 16 in your Bible, and when you do, go with me to verse 6. Take a look with me. Uh, this is talking about the Macedonian call. And it says in verse 6 from Acts chapter 16, When they had gone through Phrygia and the region, of, uh, the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Notice, they wanted to go to Asia, but God said no. Verse 7, after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So they wanted to go to Bithynia, and God said no. So passing by Mysia, verse 8, they came down to Troas, verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him and said, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he saw the vision, immediately... Paul and his group sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Notice, they were told to go to a specific place. They wanted to go to Asia. God said, no, that's not the place. They wanted to go to Bithynia. God said, no, that's not the place. The place for you is Macedonia, and specifically Philippi. If you kept on reading, they went to Macedonia and made a beeline to Philippi, which is the chief city of the province, and that's where they started the work, all right? Many people pray and ask God for guidance, but they don't get it because they're not where they're supposed to be. The counsel you're looking for, the guidance you need, the answers to prayer you stand in faith for come when you are where you're supposed to be, which leads me to the next point in our Acts 22.10 dissertation, all right? Not only was he told to go to Damascus, but when he was told to go there, Jesus said, when you get there, that's when I'm going to start talking to you. There is where I want you to be, okay? Meaning to say that when you are in the right place at the right time, guidance, your purpose in life, your direction, your anointing, everything you need to be a success becomes available to you. Jesus told Paul, when you go to Damascus, there things will be told to you. If you don't go there, I'm not going to tell you what you need to know. So be there, and I'll start talking to you there. I'll start providing guidance for you there. I'll anoint you there, okay? So make sure you're wherever there is to you, okay? Now, if you keep reading... Uh, into Acts chapter 16 and further on, for, uh, verse 15 to be specific, uh, Lydia, who was there in Philippi, a seller of purple, the Bible says she was a businesswoman, a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, she was there, and one day Paul and his group went down to the river because someone told them that everybody goes down there to pray. 
So they went down there to uh, sit and just see what happens during this prayer meeting. And so while they went down there, there's Lydia praying with everybody else down there along the riverbank. And then the Bible says God opened her heart to the things that Paul was sharing with her. And to make the long story short, she got saved and then took them back to her house and they got saved. And then from there, the gospel was introduced into Europe. She's the first European convert to Christianity was Lydia. But none of that would have happened if Paul was somewhere else. If he was in Asia, where he wanted to go, Lydia would never have heard the gospel. If he was in Bithynia, where he wanted to go after Asia was cut off the list, then still, uh, Lydia never would have heard. God wanted him there because Lydia was there. Amen. And you need to be there. Wherever that means to you, be there, and God's going to be talking to you. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Father. Then verse, and then number six from Acts 22.10. Paul was told, go into Damascus, there it shall be told you, and then here's the last point, concerning all things that have been arranged for you to do. The key word is the word arranged. God arranges things for you. He maneuvers things. He, 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 it's like a chessboard. He moves pieces around to put you in the right place to have the divine encounter with whomever it is that you need to be, uh, to, to be with or to meet you or for you to meet them or whatever. He knows how to make it happen. But you got to be in the right place. And when you're in the right place and when you're there, then things are all arranged for you and you meet the right people and, and you're in the right place at the right time. Money flows, people give you gifts, whatever the case may be. Favor finds you and surrounds you like a shield psalm says whatever it takes praise god but god is arranging things and for me i'll tell you honestly that's very very reassuring because you know i run a ministry on two continents simultaneously i don't have a church i have 150 of them i, I don't have a staff i got uh, hundreds of pastors 300 of them to be exact and i got a staff of 15 people over there and then my wife and i over here and we're trying to you know 16, 17 hour time differences. We're trying to run this thing from two different angles. If I'm here, they're over there. And if I'm there, then the thing has to be monitored over here. Listen, it's comforting for me to know that God's got my back and that he's got things arranged for me so that, praise God, uh, you know, when I get to this point, something's waiting for me there. Something I need, people I need to know, or people that need to know me, or whatever the case may be. It's, it's very reassuring for me to know he's four or five steps ahead of where I'm supposed to be. He's already arranging things for me in places where I'm not even at yet. But he knows where I'm supposed to be. And he knows that if I'm in the right place at the right time, committed to the fight, active and a player, no longer a spectator, good things are going to happen. Good things are going to happen. Amen? And that's what you and I need to realize, praise God. We need to understand that our purpose is already predestined by God to be a successful life sharing Jesus in whatever ways and to whomever, wherever. But the point is, you know, so many of us, we, we, we're like spinning our wheels and we can't figure out why this thing ain't working right. And for so many of us, it's simply because we've never really understood our purpose. Our purpose is to represent Jesus, you know? And things will be arranged for us. You know, that last point, point number six, you know, you go back to Acts chapter 10 and look at the whole chapter and see how God arranged everything so that Peter could meet Cornelius. Cornelius had a vision. Peter had a vision. They were in two separate places. Peter went up on the housetop to pray at the ninth hour, whatever hour it was. He went up there, and then there's this vision, and down comes the sheet with all the animals in it, you know, and Peter says, I'm not supposed to eat all these things. And God said, what well, I've cleansed, let no man call unclean. You know, he's trying to convey to them, I'm getting you ready for something here, buddy. And then while he's thinking on the vision, the door, you know, someone's at the door and they knock, and it's from Cornelius' house, people where Cornelius four days before or a few days before was fasting and praying, and an angel appears and says, you need to go to Joppa, go to the house of Simon the Tanner because he's got a guest staying there, and you need to hear something that he's got to say to you, so go get him. So by the time Peter's up there considering this vision, there's a door knock, you know, a knock on the door, I should say, and there they are. And they say, look, look you need to come back to, to Antioch with us. You need to come back to Cornelius' house. You need to come back because we need to hear something that you've got to say. And by the time he got there, Peter figured it out. Hey, these guys aren't Jews. Hmm. Something's amiss here. And then, you know, the Bible says, you know, they found out, hey, Jesus died for Gentiles too. 
They were shocked when the, when the Holy Spirit fell on these people. They didn't expect that. They thought Jesus died for Jews. If you wanted to be saved, you had to be a Jew. That's what they were thinking up until that time. But God arranged it all. Hallelujah. And he'll arrange things for you. You may be sitting here thinking, man, I'm out there on my own. No, you're not. God's got your back, and he's already five weeks ahead of where you're supposed to be. Amen. And if you get in the fight, get in the game, say, I'm a player, no longer a spectator, thank you, Jesus, then God's going to do great things for you. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word today, and we believe the word is rich, and it's been sown in good ground. And I praise and thank you that all of us here will be doers of the word we have heard, and that we will commit to the fight. We will go, we will do what we are instructed to do, and we will find our purpose, and we will fulfill that in Jesus' name. We will live a life that's satisfying and fulfilling as a result in every way possible. Thank you, Lord, for being great in our lives. When we position ourselves, you will be great in our lives the way you've promised. We thank you, Lord, for arranging things ahead of us, going before us so that where we're supposed to be, there is where we're going to find our fulfillment and our purpose to be fulfilled. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Did this help anybody today? Yeah. Praise God. Thank you. Praise God. All right, let's get to the most important part of any church service where we examine the condition of our heart and the position of our life before God. It's great to have messages where we get fed and edified and blessed and we learn things, but in services like this, there are always people that are struggling with where they are with God, and you might be one of those today. There were a number of people that raised their hand earlier uh, indicating to us that this is your first time here. I hope you have felt warm and welcome, but we want to challenge you without apology to examine the condition of your heart because there is a heaven and there is a hell. And this is what we tell people in the Philippines. We're very in their face about it. There's a heaven and there's a hell and you're gonna go to one or the other when you die. Doesn't matter what people say about it, that's the truth. Truth doesn't change. Now, if you are in a position where you know in the bottom of your heart you're not right with God, you need to do yourself the greatest favor you'll ever do in your life and that's be honest with yourself because you can look good to people. You can say all the right things and dress the right way and live the life that people want you to live. But God knows what's going on on the inside of your heart. He knows what you think. He knows the motives of your heart. He knows where you go. He knows who your friends are. He knows what videos you watch, the places you visit. He knows it all. So there's no point to just try to hide that because we might not know, but he does. And he's the one you're going to stand before someday. And if you're here today and you're not right with God, it would be a tragedy for you to leave this service unprepared for your eternity, risking a life in hell, walking out those doors, not ready to meet Jesus. What happens if you leave and you get hit by a car, get run over, fall over from a heart attack at 4 o'clock this afternoon? You don't know. You're one breath away from heaven or hell. So, you know, listen, if you're not right with God, here's your chance right now in this place before you leave, to get things right with God. Or if you're here and you've drifted away and you're not right where you should be and you once were on fire for the Lord and you're not anymore, well, you can make that adjustment here too. I'm talking to you as well. I'm talking to anybody here today that is not right with the Lord, whether you've never accepted him and you know it, or you once were on fire for the Lord and you're not where you should be, you've drifted away and your heart's become cold. You need to relight the pilot inside your heart. Get that pilot light lit back again. Get back into where you need to be with Jesus. Praise the Lord. You know, I made my choice a long, long time ago. I was a Catholic boy. I was very religious. I went to Mass. I did all the right things. But I was lost, and I was not right, and I was not ready with God. And when I realized it, the first thing I did was fall on my face and repent and say, Lord, forgive me and receive me. I'm sorry, and I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven, and I receive you as Lord of my life. That was my prayer. No one was with me. No one held my hand. I was in a park bench in downtown Toledo, Ohio, on my lunch break when I did it. But the point is, I did it. I did it. And so I'm going to count to three. And when I reach three, you put your hand up. And you say, it's me. You're talking to me. Now, we're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to, you know, make you feel uncomfortable. But my God, it's your life. 
I mean, we've all had to do this. If you're on your way to heaven, you've had to do it. I've had to do it. Everybody has to. You've got to invite Jesus in. If you don't, he's on the outside looking in. And if you die, you die lost. And all over the world today, there are people living their last day, breathing their last breath. And for most of them, they are not ready to meet Jesus. And for many of them, they are not ready to go. And they don't think that today is their last day either. But it is. And people who die lost do not get another chance after that. Choice is in this life. When you die, choice is removed from you. Choice is now. You have, a, you have the power to choose. You can choose life. You can choose Jesus. So do it when I count to three. It's not a feeling. It's a decision. All right? I'm looking at everybody here. You're looking at me. It's a decision. It's not a feeling. If you're waiting for a feeling, you could be waiting for quite a while. It's a decision. Feelings will follow. Jesus will make sure of that. But for now, decide to be right with God. All right? When I reach three, put your hand up. Don't be shy about it. Jesus was on a cross for you. He was not shy for you. Don't be shy for him. All right? And then we'll go from there. All right? We won't embarrass you, but we want you to be honest with your heart and where you are with God at this present time. All right? One, two, three. Put that hand up. High. One, two. Well, my God, all over. One, two, three. In the back, four, thank you. Anyone else? Come on, put your hands up if you need Jesus. You know, we're, we're with you. We're not against you. Thank you. Five, anyone else? We'll wait for you. Put your hand up if you need help. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I saw that hand. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand. You've been sitting for a while. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Now, I know there's more people that should have put their hands up. People are just people, and sometimes they're intimidated by the environment. I know that. I'm going to ask the people that did put their hands up to come down to the front, and I'm going to ask you that knew you should have and didn't to come down to the front, okay? Once again, we're not going to embarrass you, but my God, it's your life, all right? Don't assume you have a tomorrow. You, you don't have a guarantee for tomorrow. You only have a guarantee for now. This is where you're at. If you put your hand up, would you please come down to the front so we can congratulate you and pray with you? Put your hand up and come on down. And if you didn't, come on down too. Come on down. From the back, you know, there's people up there. Come on down here. Way in the back. There you go. I see you. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on down. We'll wait for you. Thank you, Father. Amen. If you know you should be down here, come down here. Praise the Lord. Congratulations. Anyone else? There's some people there. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Not anyone else. We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. Come on. There they are. Thank you, Father. Glad you came. Glad you came. Amen. Here comes some more. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Father. Amen. Congratulations. Proud of you. Amen. All of heaven is rejoicing for what's happening right here. All of heaven is uh, doing backflips and jumping through hoops because of what's happening here at this moment, because you're so precious to God. It would take too much time for us to talk about all that you're doing and what's actually happening right here, but we have trained workers that can help you. Pastor Joel here will take you. If you'd go with him for just a minute, your family and friends will wait for you. This won't take long, but he wants to pray with you and help you understand the preciousness of this moment in your life, okay? So if you'll follow him right there, will you go with him for just a second, please? Will you follow him for just a second? Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me 
and then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.